Good day and welcome to Capital Watch, the latest of the news and information going on in and around Indiana. For the right, or what could be passed for the right, I'm Abdul Hakim Shabazz. And for the left, I'm Jennifer Wagner. Well, Jennifer, uh, lots of things going on in Indiana politics. Uh, let's go ahead and start with the presidential race. Evan Bayh named as a possible nominee for Barack Obama and also Barack Obama and John McCain statistically tied here in Indiana. So let's start with Evan by first. With somebody, I, I guess you might say Evan by makes sense for Barack Obama when you're somebody as flashy and as sort of colorful and charismatic as him. You know, I guess you don't want somebody to overshadow you too much and I can't think of a better piece of white toast to be next to Barack Obama than somebody like an Evan Bayh. Well, I think probably Senator Obama is considering some of uh, Senator Bayh's other attributes, uh, his ability to stay on message being one of them, but most importantly, he has executive experience here as governor. Uh, he served, uh, you know, almost two terms in the Senate, and uh, he has some foreign policy experience, and that seems to be the area where people think Barack Obama is the weakest. So I think Evan Bayh's got a great shot at being vice president, and I certainly hope he is. But if you're going to go for somebody with foreign policy experience, why not just go ahead and go for the real deal? Why not pick somebody like a Joe Biden, who has a lot of foreign policy experience, or a former general? I mean, to me, those type of people, or somebody like a Bill Richardson, who was Secretary of the United Nations, Energy Secretary, you know, two of the really big things that are affecting everybody to me, those make a lot more sense as a vice presidential pick than somebody like Evan Bai, who, I mean, nice guy, but, I mean, let's face it, he's not going to know excite a whole lot of people. Well, I, I beg to differ with you there. He <laughs> excites a whole lot of Indiana Democrats, and I think as people get to know him, he will uh, be more exciting on the national stage as well. But, you know, I think Bill Richardson is on the short list. I think we've heard that name. We've heard Tim Kaine um, just today and yesterday kind of uh, cropping up there. But I don't think uh, Obama wants to choose someone to run with him who might overshadow him, who might say something inflammatory, uh, or who might uh, detract from his message. And well, I guess you don't want anybody who's detracting, who's possibly overshadow anybody, and would jump the gun. I guess Evan Bayh would be the perfect person. Was, and, I, and you could take also a cardboard cutout with you wherever you go and say, look, everybody, here's Evan. He's right along with me. Uh, let's look at the poll numbers. Uh, in Indiana, uh, the place that hasn't gone voted for a Democrat since, I want to say Bewitched was on the air. Back in 1964, uh, Barack Obama is actually about one point ahead, according to the last poll that I saw, uh, ahead of John McCain. Now, do you really think that a bunch of people south of Washington Street are going to go vote for a guy named Barack Obama for president? Absolutely. And, you know, the thing is, Barack Obama has a lot of staff here. He's got 90-some-odd folks in the field offices around the state, and he's really working hard, um, not just because he's from next door, but because those poll numbers are so close. Now you tell me, John McCain, uh, is he really exciting anyone? No. I'm sure he's exciting, you know, one or two, maybe three people, uh, his wife, hopefully. No, but I, but I do think what the John McCain people are counting on is that uh, Barack will generate a lot of buzz here in Indiana early on, but at the end of the day, Hoosiers not being creatures known for change, will kind of go back into their old patterns again. But I, but I will say this, if you are going to run for president, it probably couldn't hurt you to have a little bit more presence and not show up here just to be an ATM machine. and and keep taking off, so I'll give you that one. Also, uh, this week on the agenda, state politics. Joe Long Thompson continues what some of us would call a Don Quixote-esque type quest, or perhaps a Dora the Explorer Quixote type quest for the governor's race. Uh, she just put out an ad, and it's so nice to know, Jen, that blue pantsuits are back in style. <laughs> you know, she is trying to create a brand, and I think uh, her outfit in the ad and her outfit that she wears on the trail obviously plays into that, but, uh, you know, she faces an uphill struggle. We've always known that the Democratic candidate, um, regardless of which one it was, would face an uphill struggle because Mitch Daniels has a lot of money. And uh, the Democratic candidates both spent down basically to zero during the primary. And I'm glad to see her up on the air. I think if she can stay on through November uh, with some ads that really connect with people, she, uh, she definitely has a chance. This race is not about Joe Long Thompson. It's about Mitch Daniels. And he spent millions of dollars so far on what I will concede to you are beautiful ads. They are phenomenally well done. Uh, but they haven't moved the numbers. You see, but no, but if you look anywhere from the governor's own internal poll and they're about 15 points, some more, you know, traditional polls, maybe about five or six, but if you split the difference, he's about seven or eight. And if you go back to when Mitch Daniels beat Joe Kern, it was what, 53, 47, 53, 46, give or take, yeah. the Libertarian. So I would not be surprised to see Mitch Daniels win by that same margin, because what I don't see Joe Long Thompson doing is getting members of her own party. Well, have you people made peace yet? You with know, each other? I, I, I mean, I, I've yet to see the Joe Long Thompson, Jim Schellinger, 
kumbaya, come on, love will keep us together, give ourselves a big old giant hug. Well, you know. Jill Long Thompson has yet to meet with Jim Schellinger, and I assume that uh, if and when that meeting happens, that there will be a uh, consensus afterward. But you're right, it's, it's a party that uh, had two different candidates running, and some people went behind one, some people went behind the other, but I think we've got, what, 99, 98 days left. I think there's plenty of time to come together, and I think uh, things have come together at the top. So I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't blame this on party differences. I think it's just really hard to run against someone with a bunch of money and a lot of name ID. Oh, Greg Ballard did. <laughs> Speaking of Greg and Ballard, that takes, us, and, and that takes us to our <laughs> next topic. Uh, Indianapolis Mayor Greg Ballard doing a preview of the budget this week, saying that Indianapolis have a shortfall in the short run of about $26 million. The city have to borrow about $150 million uh, to make it through the rest of the fiscal year because uh, property tax dollars haven't come through. And long term, if nothing's done, the city will be facing a budget deficit of about $200 million in 2012. And Jen, I just have to say, it's nothing like Bart Peterson, the former mayor of Indianapolis, to leave such a wonderful parting gift. I mean, at least he could have left a copy of the home game, maybe a case of total wax or a year's supply of rice roni, the San Francisco tree. But instead, you know, the former mayor left us with a nice, big, nice financial message, but didn't even have the decency to leave a red tied up in a bow. You know, <laughs> that's interesting. That's your take, obviously. My take is Bart Peterson spent the last five years cutting and cutting and cutting out of the budget. And Greg Ballard ran a campaign where uh, he was uh, writing checks his actual budget can't cash. And he is now realizing that it's really hard to balance the budget, one, uh, without cutting services or raising taxes. And two, he's realizing he inherited a budget that is bare bones. The only thing Bart Peterson really put money toward, uh, basically his entire time in office, was public safety. Well, what did Greg Ballard but, run but, call, but calling this budget bare bones is like putting Mama Cass in like, you know, a really tight suit and say, hey, oh, look at me, I lost weight. I mean, if, if you go back and look from the budget hearings from last year, the Peterson people would double bill and then say, okay, everybody stop double billing. They would call those budget cuts. They wouldn't fill positions and say, look, we cut the budget, but we still left the position on the books now the budget is a cut. I mean, you want to you know, I mean, if you want to say, you know, this budget was done by Doug Henning, you know, I will give the former mayor and his staff, you know, an A-plus for, for accountancy and illusion. You know, look over here when all the magic is, is going over here. But luckily, one thing I will say about this mayor is he's not going to run. There will be real transparency, you know, unlike the former mayor whose budget you can just see right through everybody who put it together. This budget, people will actually be able to see through and actually get a line item to see where everybody's dime goes, where everybody's dollar, everyone's dollars go. So are those the new talking points? Because before he was going to hold these quarterly meetings, and he was going to cut $70 million, and because the quarterly meetings took uh, eight months to get started. Because things were just that bad for uh -huh. the people who left them now. Uh -huh. I will say where the former mayor and those, where the current mayor, those guys made a mistake, is they should have come right out of the gate and let the people know, here's how bad this situation is, because they got the transition reports. But instead, for some reason, somebody decided somewhere, you know what, I think we ought to just sit on this for a while. That, I think, was a, was a tactical error, because I'd have been out there every day pointing for the $20,000 hammers, the $34,000 chairs, and particularly one sitting in Monroe Gray's office that was never used, you know, the phone the taxpayers Now you're for. mixing executive branch and legislative branch, but... But uh, I thought you guys were all one big happy party. You know, I thought you guys were, too. We won't get into the, uh, the issues of the county chair and the mayor, but... Oh, that'll uh, be for the next episode. That will be for the next watch. episode. You know, the bottom line is Greg Ballard probably just learned how to read the budget. Um, it's a really complicated thing, and he ran a very simple campaign on the message that he could do better, he could cut money, he would uh, take over the police department, which he did. But the bottom line is, it's really hard to be mayor, and he's finding that out, and at some point, I agree with you, he probably should have come out right away and said, I can't meet these promises that I made on the campaign trail. I messed up, I said things that I can't possibly do, and here's my plan. But we're now eight months in, and he has no plan, he has no vision, he has absolutely nothing other than blaming the past administration, which is the oldest trick in the book, and people aren't going to buy it, because Bart Peterson was well-liked, and he was well-respected. And that's why he got elected, re-elected well, to a third term. I think people were happy with the quality of life under Bart Peterson, and when they start seeing their services cut, when they start seeing their fees increased or their services privatized, and Greg Ballard tries to convince them that things are better than they were under Bart Peterson, he's going to have a problem. And that's something ladies and gentlemen, we'll talk about on our next episode of the Capitol Watch. But before we go, another little feature we'd like to do here at the Capitol Watch, sort of a thumbs up or a thumbs down, where we pick the elected or appointed official who deserve the big giant thumbs up or a thumbs down. And this week getting a total and complete thumbs up is IMPD officer Jason Fishburne. Officer Fishburne who was shot in the head while pursuing a suspect July 10th out of a coma this week. The first thing he said was he's ready to go fishing and told his wife uh, just recently that he loves her. So a big thumbs up for officer Jason Fishburne. I would have to agree with Abdul. Um, what he has endured and what his family have endured and what the police department has endured 
are, uh, are remarkable and that he survived and is making a full recovery. Truly a thumbs up and I hope he gets to go fishing soon. And also for a thumbs down, Vernon Brown, City County Council member who continues to push a repeal of uh, the county option income tax for public safety, but has yet to put any numbers or any math anywhere. Imagine that. Thumbs down for Mitch Daniels this week. Uh, we found out just today that uh, FSSA uh, not serving the people that it should be under the privatization scheme that he pushed forward. And I think that's just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to what we're going to find out about his selling off of state government. But it does you no good if you don't have a candidate who can't get a message out but looks great in a blue pants. She does have a nice suit. <laughs> this has been the Capitol Watch sitting on the right side of things. I'm Abdul Hakim Shabazz. And over here on the left, Jennifer Wagner. Good day.